Welcome to Stories from the Village of Nothing Much. Like easy listening, but for fiction. I'm Catherine Nikolai. I write and read all the stories you'll hear on the Village of Nothing Much. Audio engineering and sound design is by Bob Wittersheim. Oh, I am so glad you're here. I have some lovely stories for you today. I'm going to introduce you to the most popular residents of the village of Nothing Much. Their names are Marmalade and Crumb, and they could pretty much have their own show. Hmm, note to self. In the meantime, I'll tell you their origin stories, how they met and became family. If you are new here, welcome. I tell family-friendly, conflict-free fiction, stories that help you relax, unwind, and focus on things that feel good and connect you to what is good in the world. I think storytelling and stories can be therapeutic, and sometimes I need a soft landing after living in the world for a while, a way to settle into something soft. So if that's true for you too, well, you're in the right place. I also tell these stories with my magical sleep voice. On my bedtime story podcast, nothing much happens. So if you need a bit of help easing your mind at night, you can find it on any podcast app. Now, before we step into the village, let's take a deep breath in through the nose and sigh from the mouth. Nice. One more time. Breathe in. And let it go. Good. Our stories today are about family coming together, one member at a time, as they're found and recognized. We'll start by following some tiny paw prints in the snow digging through the cupboard to find food dishes, and stoking the fire for any wandering visitors in need of some warmth in Lost and Found. Then we'll watch the spring arrive, for Scythia blooms and branches full of birds as we get to know each other, in toast and marmalade. And finally, we'll flip through the pages of the village newspaper, till we're stopped by a face that is new but instantly familiar, in marmalade and crumb. Lost and found. I might not have known about her if the snow hadn't fallen overnight. The weather had been mild for days with bright sun and warm air that still smelled of leaves and grass. But just before I'd gone to bed the night before, I poked my head out of the front door and felt the cold snap setting in. I'd looked up at the streetlight on the corner and seen the first few flakes of the season falling. Those first snowflakes are almost always thin, tiny, like specks of sawdust or fine confetti coming down. And it seems impossible that something so insubstantial can build up enough to need clearing away with shovels and plows. The flakes get bigger, fluffier, and fall more thickly as the season goes on, as if they are growing through their own lifespan with the passing months. And by the end of the winter, they retreat and eventually give over to spring raindrops. The thin flakes had built up overnight, though, leaving an even half inch of snow on the ground. This morning, when I opened the front door again, I noticed a line of tiny, unmistakable paw prints that traveled out from under the edge of the skip laurel bush and up onto the front step where they turned and wandered off down the drive and disappeared under a Japanese yew. Oh dear, I said, my breath a cloud in the cold air. Someone had come knocking in the night to be let in and I hadn't heard it. I pulled a coat on over my pajamas and stepped out onto the crisp snow in my slippers. 
I followed the paw prints to the yew and squatted down to see if I could spot their owner among the thick branches. I called out a low, kitty, 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 but didn't see or hear any response. Hmm. I stood back up and propped my hands on my hips. Well, I had a few ideas about what to do next. I walked back up to the door and turned to look around again as I went through. She was out there, maybe watching me right now. And I just needed to find a way to invite her in. Inside, I shook off my jacket and stepped into the living room. I needed to make a comfortable, warm spot for her. Some place she could nestle into until she was ready to come inside. I looked into the corner of the room, a bare space on the wood floor beside the bookcase. I didn't have a kitty bed. Not anymore. I'd given things away after. It had been a couple of years now since I'd heard the tinkle of the bell on his collar or felt him jumping silently into bed in the wee hours of the morning. I found a box in the back hall and took a blanket from the linen closet. I went next door to ask my neighbor for a bowl full of kibble and to make sure her cat was safely accounted for. They met me at the door and listened as I told the story of the paw prints in the snow. My neighbor handed over a whole bag of food so I wouldn't need to drive out to a store anytime soon. She bent down to pick up her cat and pressed her to her chest and said she hoped my plan with the box and the kibble would work and work quickly. I told her that I had a feeling it would. It was something my mother used to say, that when it was time for your next dog or cat, they would find you. They would show up on your doorstep and simply ask to be let inside. I hoped she was right, but of course, she'd said that back when finding a furry friend wasn't done mostly online. And I wondered sometimes if my next rescue was waiting for me somewhere else, and I was missing it. I set up the box between the shrubs and the front door, turned on one side so it had a floor and a ceiling, and draped the blanket in a way I hoped a cat would find inviting. I set a small bowl of kibble in and tiptoed away to see if she might like a snack and a rest. Inside, I tried to busy myself with a few chores. I filled the sink up with hot, soapy water and washed dishes, talking to myself as I scrubbed and rinsed. I wondered if she liked to play with toys, if she liked a squeaky mouse filled with catnip or just a plain piece of string dangled in the air. I took a fresh towel from the drawer, and I dried and put away the clean dishes, pushing the forks and spoons through my towel-wrapped fingers and laying them away in their divided slots. What would I call her? I shook my head, thinking that I was getting ahead of myself. I might never see her at all. She might have picked another door by now and already been brought inside by someone else. Still, I found myself digging a couple of small dishes, one for food, one for water, out from the back of the cupboard that hadn't been used in years, and leaving them ready on the counter, just in case. The skies were clouding over, and I'd seen in the paper that more snow was coming. I decided to bring in some firewood and fill the log holder to the top. I didn't need to go through the front door to get to the store of wood. I could have slipped out the back and across the patio stones to the side yard, but I couldn't help myself. I opened the door slowly, just in case there was someone on the step. And though there wasn't, there was a fresh trail of prints circling around the box and a few stray kibble pieces on the pavement, as if someone had leaned in to catch up a mouthful and dropped a couple on the way out. I went to get the wood with a smile on my face. After three trips in and out, I figured I had enough to keep the fire burning through a snowstorm. I laid kindling and a few thinner strips of wood with some scrunched up newspaper in the grate and struck a long match. I moved the match from spot to spot, letting the flame catch, and just as it had burned down, 
and I'd toss the last inch of it on top of the kindling. I heard the smallest, softest meow. Like a question mark floating, like my breath had in the cold air. I stepped over to the door and slowly opened it. She was small, probably still a kitten, and the bright orange of marmalade. She had crumbs in her whiskers, and I saw the empty bowl tipped over inside the box. I've got more of that, you know, I said, and stood back to let her in. Over the crackle of the catching fire, I heard her meow again. She raced in past me, and I closed the door behind her. Toast and marmalade. It had only been a few months since we met, but we both knew this was it. This was love. And it had been from that day in the early winter. The first snowfall when I'd found her paw prints at my front door. When I'd rigged up a makeshift bed from a cardboard box and bribed her with a big bowl of kibble. We'd been missing each other, like two ships in the night. But then finally I'd heard a small meow. And when I opened the door, she'd raced right in. Since then, we'd been together. That first night, she curled up in front of the fire, and I'd curled up around her, and we'd stayed like that for a while. I didn't know how long she'd been outside, but by how deeply she slept, by how much she reveled in a warm bed, and how many bowls of kitten chow we went through, I would guessed it had been a while. It was the best feeling to tell her, even if she couldn't quite understand me, that she'd never be hungry again. She'd never be without a soft place to lay or without company if she wanted it. And she did. She followed me through the house, wherever I went. She wound through my ankles when I stood peeling carrots at the sink. She helped me make the bed, diving out from between blankets to pounce on my fingers as they smoothed the sheets. She sat with me while we watched the snow melt and the birds come back to the bushes and shrubs in the backyard. We were mostly inseparable, although she had been a bit cross with me after her first visit with the doctor. She'd howled all the way home, then run straight out of her carrier to pout under the bed for a few hours. But by the time I had our fire going in the living room, she inched out to take her place on the sofa and allowed me to lay a hand on her back. I'd made it up to her with a bit of shopping. She got new bowls to eat her meals from, a new bed that had a flap like an envelope that she loved to tuck herself into, and a sweet little collar. We'd discussed color options, what would go best with her orange-red fur, and found a pretty paisley one in shades of yellow and cream. It had a tiny bell that rang as she pounced through the halls, and a small charm with her name, Marmalade, on the front, and my number on the back. She was still a kitten, and it had been so long since I'd had a kitten that I'd forgotten the pure fun that came with that. She made a game of everything. I bought her a basket full of toys, stuffed mice, and feathers on strings, and while I often found them carefully tucked inside the flap of her bed, I imagined her like a dragon sitting on her gold. She was just as happy to play with pencils from my desk or jump at dangling sleeves of sweaters as I attempted to get them onto hangers in the laundry room. I most liked to watch her discover something for the first time. Once while I was running a bath, she'd climbed up on the radiator beside it, and I scooped up a handful of bubbles and blew them into the air. Her head twitched back and forth, watching them as they scattered and fell. She reached out her curious nose and... Only her kitty reflexes had kept her from tumbling into the water. 
along with her wariness of the tub, she developed a love-hate relationship with the toaster. The first time a piece of bread had come springing up out of it, she jumped a mile as she tried to catch it and simultaneously get away from it. I hadn't laughed like that in so long. Another day, a friend had come visiting with his sweet, gentle giant of a greyhound. Marmalade's eyes widened comically as he trotted into the living room. She watched him from her perch on the windowsill for as long as she could stand, then gave into her curiosity and dropped down to sneak closer. The dog, a senior and a rescue himself, who, by my friend's account, liked nothing so much as spending nearly every hour of the day dozing in various spots around the house, had found a patch of sunlight on the rug and stretched out languorously on his side. Marmalade crept closer, inch by inch, then dug her nails into the carpet and pulled herself back like a rubber band about to be shot across the room. When the dog didn't so much as look at her, she changed tack and stepped up closer, striding through his long legs, eventually coming to nestle into the curved space behind his front paws. She sidled closer until she was pressed tight against him and promptly fell asleep. My friend and I had let them to it and went to have lunch at the kitchen table. When we poked our heads back in an hour later, they were just where we'd left them. And now we scheduled regular nap dates for the two of them. As the spring weather got warmer, we spent time on the screened-in porch off the kitchen. It was on the east side of the house and caught all the morning sunlight, so it was often warmer than the house itself. This morning I'd noticed that the forsythia shrub in the far corner of the yard was in full bloom. She watched me as I strode out in my mud boots with my garden shears and came back a minute later with a basket full of branches lined with cheery yellow flowers. She followed me to the kitchen and hopped on the counter as I pulled out an old ceramic pitcher from the cupboard. As I let the water warm, best to keep the blooms open, she reached a cautious paw out to play in the stream. I filled the pitcher and settled the branches into place. I carried it back out to the screened-in porch and set it on a table beside my favorite chair. I went back in and dropped a couple pieces of bread into the toaster for breakfast as I watched her jump up beside the forsythia. She sat regarding the flowers with all four paws in a row and her tail curled around them. I realized that since she'd been home, we hadn't had a vase of flowers out. She'd seen the Christmas tree and had been fascinated by it, but I'd skipped buying poinsettias, afraid that she would chew on them. The vet thought she'd likely been born in early autumn, so these might be the first flowers she'd ever seen. I watched her stretch her short, furry neck out toward the blooms. She let them drape over her cheek and forehead and just stayed very still with her eyes closed. I smiled in the kitchen, thinking of all the moments she'd made me laugh or gasp or marvel at her and felt so lucky that she'd picked my door that snowy day. I'd heard once that dogs don't do what-ifs, and I hoped it was the same with cats. What if I hadn't been home? What if the snow had been heavier, the night colder? She didn't worry about such things. She just sat, her face draped in tiny yellow flowers, breathing in the sweet almond scent of them, the toast about to pop up and make her jump for the next exciting moment of her life here at home. Marmalade and Crumb. We'd seen his picture in the paper. Marmalade and I had been flipping through the pages on the couch. I was reading and she was swatting at the edges of the paper. I realized as I watched her trying to clamp her paw over the weather report that she must be almost a year old by now. 
We'd found each other the year before, on the first snowfall of the year, and the vet said she was likely two months old then. I reached out to scratch around her ears. Her collar felt a bit small around her neck. She was growing fast. The back door was open beside us, and a breeze rose up all of a sudden. The paper in my lap danced in the wind, the pages flipping and fluttering. Marmalade pounced on them gleefully, and I laughed and tugged it away from her as she chased. When I finally got it back, she'd torn out a scrap that clung to one claw. She shook it in the air, a confused look on her face, and I laughed again as I reached out to carefully detangle it. That's when we saw him. His face looked up at us from the torn piece of paper. A little brown dog with wiry hair and stilty legs. He looked like his whole body would bounce when he barked. He looked like he was ready for an adventure. He looked like he would carry a stick twice his size for blocks and never stop wagging his tail. I fitted the torn piece back into the paper, reading that he was two of indeterminate breed, looking for a family, and named Crumb. Since he was many shades of brown and his wiry hair stood out all over, making him look a bit crunchy. The paper said he would be at the pet store downtown with his fellow adoptees all day today if anyone was interested in meeting him. I looked at Marmalade. She looked at me. We both looked down at Crumb. I bit my lip, thinking of how Marmy loved to jump at toast when it came popping out of the toaster. How our mornings were already full of crumbs. And couldn't we make room for just one more? I pulled her into my lap and thought again that her collar was a bit tight. I needed to go to the pet store anyway to pick out a new one for her. What would be the harm in stopping to shake paws with Crumb while I was there? Driving over, I had butterflies in my stomach and drummed my fingers on the wheel, impatient for the lights to change and traffic to move. I think I knew already, probably had as soon as I'd seen his little face the brown dots in his eyebrows and his scraggly whiskers and funny snaggle tooth that it was already a done deal. I knew that Marmalade liked dogs in general. She had a giant greyhound friend who she'd played with and snuggled with since she was a kitten and had met a few others, all with good results. She liked to play and older dogs seemed happy to let her. She'd chase their tails or pounce on them while they slept, and they often barely opened one eye to watch her do it. Young dogs played right along with her, and she liked that as well. She'd outsmarted my brother's basset hound, reaching one sly, rippled paw out from under the sofa to swipe his toys while he looked the other way, and had been well pleased with herself afterwards. When I pulled up to the shop, I saw signs for the rescue that was holding the adoption fair, posted at the street, and counted the cars in the parking spots, worried that I might already be too late. What if Crumb had gone home with somebody else? I remembered feeling the same way that day I'd first seen Marmy's paw prints in the snow. Not possessive, but surely protective. I hadn't wanted to stand in the way of someone else's feline love connection, but I had simply felt, down deep in my bones, that the lever of those little prints was already my cat. And when I opened the door to find her waiting on the step, it was a family reunion. I tried not to get ahead of myself with Crumb, but the feeling was the same. If someone else had filled out an application for him. Well, it was understandable, but it was simply a mistake. He was mine. I stepped inside and pretended I was going to go get the collar first. I even made it halfway down an aisle, but then I took a quick turn and headed toward the back, where I could hear a few barks and bays. 
There were volunteers in yellow t-shirts, a few kitties and carriers, and a playpen full of puppies. A couple people were bending over them with clipboards in their hands, clearly ready to adopt. My eyes went searching for Crumb. Most of the crates were already empty, their occupants having found their people and gone home. I squatted down beside a crate with his name hand-printed on a tag and peered in, but there was no crumb inside. I let out a sigh and bit my lip again. Oh, well, I started to say to myself, maybe it wasn't meant to be, but I didn't believe it. I pushed my palm against my thigh, easing my body up from the floor and hoping that wherever he was, he was happy and safe. And then I saw him. He was sitting in the lap of one of the volunteers, getting petted and looking straight at me, wagging his tail like he'd been waiting all day for me to show up. I sat down in the folding chair beside him, and he jumped from his foster's lap straight into mine. She laughed, handing me over his leash and saying, let me introduce you. This is Crumb. I finished, smiling up at her. We saw him in the paper. Oh, good, she said. He hasn't had any visitors yet today, so he was feeling a bit left out. I scratched his ears, and he leaned into me, tilting his cheek up and letting me get under his chin with my fingernails. One back leg began thumping away as I scratched, and I was laughing again. He was little like a heavy loaf of bread, and his weight felt good in my arms. He had pale, hazel eyes and a stout, small body, and did indeed bounce when he barked. He let me toss a squeaky ball for him, which he chased down and brought back to me for more. I thought he would be the perfect match for marmalade. They could hide each other's toys and fight over who got which bed by the fire this winter. He hopped back up into my lap and laid down, his paws hanging off my leg and panting a little. He rested his chin down on his paws and was instantly relaxed. My heart was brimming, and as I stroked his back, I was already thinking about what color collar to get him. Would he need a sweater for the cool weather? His own set of dishes and a bed, of course. The volunteer who'd been watching us held out a clipboard with his name across the top and raised her eyebrows. I slipped the handle of his leash over my wrist so he couldn't get away from me as I reached out for it. We would be a family of three. Thanks for spending some time with us in the village of nothing much. Till next time, we wish you a peaceful week. Know that you belong. You matter. Your health and happiness are important. I know I'm just a stranger on the internet, but I care. So please be gentle with yourself.